We're actually moving past just velocity and acceleration, finally. So we're moving on to a new concept, momentum. Momentum, the idea of momentum is, um, this was coming from Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes. And Rene Descartes, um, Rene Descartes decided that someone should turn off his iPhone. Um, and what he said, he, he wanted, he knew about something moving and something had velocity, but something's going to collide. It's not just the velocity that's important. So he called it the quantity of motion. So momentum is the quantity of motion, meaning not just how fast you're going, but how much you got behind it. Okay, so um, it's going to be similar to what we talk about in inertia in a little bit, the fact that the heavier an object has, the more inertia it could have, but also the more momentum. So just a little, you will hear about inertia down the road, and you will hear that it's a little similar. But today, I'll give you the equation. The equation for momentum is P equals MV. The letter P stands for momentum because M is already going to be taken for mass. So P stands for momentum, and momentum is mass times velocity. got to keep it to one level. All right, the units for momentum. Huh? The units. Units are going to be in multiple letters, but not the uh, not the letter, not the not the variable. All right. Now, to think about the units for Rene Descartes wasn't wasn't important enough to get his own units named after him. So you won't hear about so many Descartes or anything like that, the units for momentum are just going to be kilogram meters per second. Okay, because the units for mass in this class will always be kilograms. I know this is the first time talking about mass in physics, but mass we don't measure in grams because they're too small. We always measure in kilograms. Okay, um, and velocity we already know is meters per second. So every time we talk about, kilo, or about um, momentum, we're talking about kilogram meters per second. Some people will kind of get lazy and say KGMS, but that kind of makes it sound like they're <coughs> multiplied. Okay? Okay. Can I move on or do I need to wait? Keep going. Keep going. I think. I think. Okay. So, a couple things about momentum. Uh, think about you versus a Mack truck. You on your bike versus a Mack truck, right? You might be going 5 meters per second, the Mack truck might be going 4 meters per second, but the Mack truck's going to win. So mass is important, right? Mass times velocity. And the bigger the mass, the more momentum. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Now, um, there was a scenario one time where I knew there, there was a story about a guy on a motorcycle. And he was um, evading police, took off on his motorcycle and went so fast that he, he got into an accident, slammed into the side of an Escalade, and flipped the Escalade. Wow. Now, if you think about the mass that that motorcycle had compared to the mass of the Escalade, um, that meant he had to have a ridiculously high velocity to make that thing, huh? How fast was he going? I don't know. I think over 100 miles an hour. Can we figure it out? Huh? Can we figure it out on the equation? We could. You know what? I'm gonna. We're very soon. Hopefully, we'll have them. Well, we. I've had the uh, crash investigation unit come in. The so the Prince William County Police have their crash investigation unit, and they go to a scene and they can reconstruct what happened. Um, and they've come in. A, they've presented to our classes before. And that's what they have to do. They have to figure out how fast the car is going. And they purely, they'll use all the physics I teach. So we talk about momentum. They do a lot of momentum, a lot of collisions. Um, we will talk about energy. They, they have to measure skid marks on the road to figure out how fast the car was going before they slammed on the brakes. Um, so there's a lot of really cool things that they do that are coming straight from the formulas we cover. Um, so yeah, we will be able to figure stuff like that out. We should try running into what? Yeah. 
That didn't work out too well for the guy. Yeah, because those, those police I talked to, they, they knew about that incident. Okay, um, now, driving a school bus, there's one of the big reasons there's no, there are, they don't have seat belts on a school bus is because a school bus has so much momentum, okay? If you went and had a head-on collision with a Ford Fiesta and you're driving a school bus, okay, you might have a small little ding on your bumper and the Fiesta is destroyed. Okay, because there's so much mass behind that school bus compared to the car, um, just a small little fender bender for the bus can be a major, major uh, collision for the car. <coughs> all right, so then, so if you think about the, the people, and yeah, they do have a the little bit of pads behind the seats and all that, but there'll be very little, you know, the car might go from 30 to zero, okay, where the bus might go from 30 to 25 or something. You know, because of the difference in masses. So that's that's one reason why they don't have uh, seat belts on a school bus. All right, now moving on. I used to coach freshman football here. You want to see how the freshman, the first day of tackling, tackle? Ready? Here we go. So the freshman's up here. He's ready to tackle for the first time. Kid starts running at him, and he falls back and tries to hold on to one ankle. And he gets dragged across the field for a little bit, right? So, because they're afraid to hit. And so we, tell them, we told them that they have to be the hammer, not the nail. They need to be the hitter, not the hit E. But it's really with momentum, okay? Because you have some freshman football players that are this tall, and you have fre some freshman football players that are this tall, all right? And this guy has to tackle that guy. So, they have to improve and, or increase their velocity if they want to tackle. Okay, so we talk about being the hitter, you know, moving in, increasing your velocity. Because if you, if you just stand still, your momentum zero. And he's moving a little bit, he's going to have more momentum. If we increase our velocity, we increase our momentum, and we can win that tackle. Sound good? Cool. All right. I teach you lifelong lessons here. All right, now, uh, also remember that this is a little bit of momentum, a little bit of uh, uh, Stopping distance, which would be energy too, but realize that you know, ever ever notice like there's a long line for an off ramp on the highway, and you see all these cars zipping in in front of the big truck. That's a really really bad idea, okay? Because understand that those trucks, even if they're going slowly, they have a much much higher mass, so they have a much much higher momentum, so they need that stopping distance because that little car zips in and pulls in front. Well, that bus might need that stopping distance to, sl to slow down enough to actually stop. Yeah, you don't cut off those cars. Those, those Big Mac trucks or bad things can happen. Okay? Okay. Uh, all right. Now, all that stuff is, is well and good, and Peagle's MV will be used. I will have, like, I don't know, two questions where I say, what's the momentum of this? Or what has more momentum? this mass and velocity or that mass and velocity and you have to multiply the two but really that's kind of boring and, and not very very useful what is useful is the concept of conservation of momentum conservation of momentum will say the total momentum before something happens will always be equal to the total momentum after something happens okay and this is where the car the police crashes the car accidents are important Okay, the, the crash investigation unit will look at the two cars and they'll see what happened to the cars after the collision. Okay, they can see where one car is compared to the other car, how much it skidded away or whatever, and they can work their way backwards and then figure out how much the momentum after had to be equal to the momentum before, and then they can figure out how fast that car was going before it collided. So they just use this formula. They, they use momentum. Now, if it spins, there's a little extra stuff that we don't have to deal with. But it's just this. Momentum before is equal to momentum after. Now, that means, remember if we use the letter P for momentum, P1 plus P2 equals P1 prime plus P2 prime. All right, so let's use an example. Okay. A student named Ricky is about ready to collide with me. Okay. I'm running towards Ricky with a velocity or with a momentum. Okay, we'll just think momentum. Let's say I'm running towards him and I have some made up number of momentum of five. 
Now, Ricky is running towards me. He's going the opposite direction. I'm running towards him. I'm running that way with five. And let's say he has a momentum of one in the opposite direction. How much total momentum before is in that collision? I have five. I'm going towards Ricky. Ricky has one. He's going towards me in the opposite direction. Five, okay, and one. Now, how much total momentum is there? Four. Four. Is it working now? Yeah, it's, it's working. recording. It's right now. All right, so the total momentum before, if I'm going one way with five and Ricky is coming towards me in the opposite direction with one, total, total momentum is going to be four. Okay, and these are just made up numbers. Now, let's say that I, after I collide with him, I'm getting slowed down a little bit. So now I only have a momentum of two. How much momentum does Ricky have to have? One. Two. Two. two, right? Because two plus two has to add up to the total four over here. Now, there's no, such, there's no momentum kind of radar gun thing. It's not like we can measure momentum. We do measure velocity. So we do have it like this, just to understand the concept, but really, with numbers, we need to know velocity. So remember P equals MV? We have to repl replace the, um, the P's with MV. Now, before I do that, though, I want you to notice these little tick marks, OK? What this means is, so if P1, if that was my momentum, OK? Momentum of person number one. I'm number one, Ricky. All right? Momentum person number two. Okay. Now, after I collide, I still I want to still talk about my momentum, momentum of person number one, but the number is going to be different. So I put a little tick mark there just to say that it's changed. Okay. I'm still talking about me. I'm still talking about my momentum, but the number is different. His number is going to be different too, so he gets a tick mark also. Okay. So, anyways, P equals MV, so we sub substitute it in, and that's going to be the new formula. Jessica, you want to pause there? Pause for station identification. How do I do that? Just click the big button. Yeah. <laughs> Realistically, we're using the M1V11. Oh. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, there are three types of events you need to know about: elastic, inelastic, and recoil. Here's the first one. I'm going to let you copy this down. Elastic. Okay. Let me explain it, and then I'll give you time to copy it down. With an elastic collision, two objects will be separate, they collide, and they bounce off each other. All right, that's elastic. Inelastic will be separate before, they collide, and they stick together. Recoil will be they're stuck together before, and they separate. Okay, so elastic is first. Elastic momentum is conserved, and all of them momentum will be conserved, okay? Energy, however, will be conserved in elastic. That's not the case for inelastic. And last, objects are going to bounce off. Okay, and the way to remember elastic is one, elastic, E for energy, energy is conserved. Okay, and also, elastic bands are also called rubber bands, rubber bounces. So elastic collisions, the, the objects bounce. All right, we'll pause so you can copy We'll pause so you can copy. In inelastic, momentum still conserved. So notice how I'm saying momentum is conserved. It's always conserved. Just like elastic, momentum is conserved in inelastic too. It'll always be the same. Okay. However, in inelastic, energy could be lost, or energy is lost. How many people here have been in a car accident, like a fender bender? Oh. <laughs> Okay, that'll work too. Has anyone felt the be the bumper? Yes. What did anyone notice anything about the bumper? It's always gone and destroyed. It's like it's hot. Oh, okay. oh, I don't oh, know. Did he fix it? The bumper. If you have a bumper that's dented in, it will be hot. Okay, that's energy that was being released. If you think about, it, you have this car that's moving along. You have kinetic energy. So that car is moving along, and all of a sudden it hits a tree and stops. Well, that car 
the energy has to be released into something. It gets released into heat. It gets released into sound. The deforming, it's going to take energy to deform that, that bumper. Okay. So there's ways that the energy has to be released. So in inelastic collisions, there's going to be a loss of energy. Okay? So again, if elastic was this, bouncing off, inelastic is that, sticking together. Okay? A football tackle. Anything where two objects are going to get stuck together after is an inelastic collision. So in inelastic, objects are sticking together. Okay? All right. Can I move on? No. I'll, then we'll pause. Don't, no, no, not yet. Be, you can look at these equations as the equations, but also you realize they're all really the same thing. However, if two things get stuck together, if, they, if they're stuck together, they have to have the same velocity. So you can factor them out. Okay? So math-wise, you can think of it as factoring, and well, this V and that V must be the same if you can factor it. However, you can also just look at these equations like a picture, all right, to help you remember which equation works. Now, one. The left-hand side will always be before. The right-hand side will always be after. Okay? You always, whenever you look at the equation, you'll say, this is before the collision or whatever. This is after. All right? So we already talked about this one, inelastic. Um, but another way is, again, like I said about the pictures, you can say, well, two objects are separate before. They collide, and they're separate after. All right? Now, this one, two objects are separate before, they collide, and now they're stuck together after. They're stuck together by the parentheses. All right? Recoil is just going to be the opposite. You have two objects that are stuck to together before, something happens, and now they're separate. How many people have fired a gun? Okay, whoa. Yeah. That's been asked for you. All right, anyways. So, when you fire a gun, what do they, what do they call recoil? Yeah. That's like when it fires back. Yeah, what, is, what else do they call that? Oh. The kick, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> I'm going to point my finger gun away from everyone here, okay? <laughs> with, a, with a gun, if I fire a bullet, the bullet and the gun are together at first. They're both sitting here, okay? So, gun, bullet, their velocity is going to be zero, although it could be moving. We could do something else, but they're stuck together before. Now, I fire the bullet. The bullet goes off at some high velocity that way. Well, it has a mass and it has a velocity, so it has to have some kind of momentum going that direction. If the momentum before was zero, and now all of a sudden you have momentum of one thing going one way, you have to have momentum going the other way. You have to have that kick of the gun firing back the other way. Okay? If the velocities are the same no matter what kind of gun, but you fire a bigger bullet, then you'll have a bigger kick. You'll have a higher velocity going back the opposite way. Let me finish my thought and then I'll get to you. Okay? So there always has to be a kick. If one thing all of a sudden fires one direction, you have to have a kick going the other way. You have to have recoil. All right? You see these, ever see the cowboy shows where the cowboy gets shot and he fire, flies back into the air, right? Yeah. Unless the guy firing the gun did the same thing when he shot it, there's no way that a guy's going to fly back after he gets hit. There's not enough momentum in that bullet to make a guy fly back into the air. What if it's one of those like, really big guns? If it's like a cannon, okay? If you see a cannon, the cannons will fire back pretty big. But if it's a, just a bullet, you could have a really big shotgun or whatever, and something gets hit, it's not going to fly back. It doesn't have enough momentum to fly that thing back. And if something did, if, if, if let's say the cowboy got hit and he flies back, that means there had to be the same amount of momentum when they fired it. And so the guy shooting the gun better have that same momentum, it better be flying back the same amount. He's really strong. Okay? You just killed every Western. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, John. Um, you mean just like a tank? When you fire yeah, like a, t a tank. Yeah, now you're going to have a much bigger shell. So that would cause something to fly back, but the tank also is a whole lot heavier than a guy being uh, than a guy shooting a gun. So the tanks, but a tank's gonna have to move back too. No matter what, momentum always has to be conserved. Okay, so even with a tank, even when you see those big cannons on a on a battleship, 
you're gonna see that huge cannon fly back with a really high velocity because of the super high velocity of that, that large shell being fired, or whatever, round, whatever. Okay, so that's what recoil is. I mean, you can do the same thing with, you know, books. You stand still, or you, let's say you're sitting on a chair with wheels. You take a big stack of books, throw it in one direction, you're gonna have to go back the opposite direction, no matter what. Huh? Or you probably If you throw them, you have to have momentum, though. You have to go the other way. Okay? All right. All right, now, last thing I want to talk about. Here's more examples of momentum. First up, let's say that you are going to break in pool. All right, you ready? So, let's say I want to make a break. I don't want to break with just my arm. I want to transfer as much momentum into that cue ball to break the rack. We know what I'm talking about? Okay? If I just have my arm, then I only have the momentum of this small part being transferred to the ball. So what I want to do is I want to get my whole body behind it. Okay? You want to throw your whole body into a break so that your momentum of your entire body gets transferred to that cue ball. Make sense? All right, so you'll see that. Some people do a little break and just taps like that and one ball falls off. You got to get your whole body behind it. All right. See, these are all lifelong examples and, and lifelong learning, things to help you in the future. Okay, so now let's say you're playing pool and you do a bad, bad break. The next time you're in a bar fight, <laughs> boxers are not going to punch with their arms. Boxers don't punch like this. They got to punch with their body. Right. So if I want to punch, I'm not going to punch with my arm. There's not a lot of momentum here. I'm going to punch with my whole body. I'm going to get my whole body behind the punch because there's more mass moving along, so there's more, moment, more momentum. Does that make sense? So pretty much if I want to knock somebody out, just get my whole body. If you want, right. If you, next time you're in a bar fight, okay, not this, that. Okay. All right. Um, I talk about that with wrestling, too, about like chopping a guy's arm or something. Same thing. We don't want to just chop with our arm. We want to get our whole body behind it. Okay, um, now just in case you were planning on doing this, I'll, you can learn from my, uh, my example, don't ever play baseball with a semi-deflated basketball. Why would you do that? I don't know why I did it, but I did it. Yeah. Okay, it was seventh grade, and my friends and I decided hey, let's play baseball with this basketball. So, we had, we had a basketball, and I had an aluminum baseball bat. So when my friend threw the aluminum baseball bat at me, or uh, threw the, yeah, that would have been worse. If my, when my friend, threat, let's try that again. When my friend threw the basketball, and I swung, the basketball basically stopped right there. And the baseball bat came flying back into my face. Okay? I go to the ground. My friend says, hey, let me see it. And as soon as I pick my hand off, there's a knot about this big over my eye already. Okay? The momentum of a basketball, there's way much, way more mass of that basketball. So all that momentum got transferred to the bat. And the bat that I just swung like this all of a sudden flew back at me and got me right in the face. Ouch. Okay? That would be a good idea. Okay? Now, let's do one more example with that. You're actually going to do it? No. Okay, here we go. Here is a basketball. Let's see how high up it bounces back. Deflated? It's a little bit deflated, yeah, but. Okay? So about there, right? Now, let's do this. Let me do it over here. This is going to work better. Here we go. So we have this. And we have this. All right, so the golf ball got back to about, here, up to about there. Now, what if we put the two together? They're probably going to come apart. They will. Let's do that again. Alright, so 
What happens was the basketball doesn't go as high, but it doesn't have, it's not that much of a change, but the basketball has momentum transfer from the ball to the, or to the, from the basketball to the golf ball. So which is why the golf ball can go that much higher. Just a little bit of momentum change, because this is a smaller mass, means a much higher velocity. All right, again, there you go, ready? Ah. Oh. Ah. I choked. Okay. I choked. So, we'll pause it.